And who indeed is Evans the Adam? Is he the physicist that could literally end the world when they turn on CERN this Wednesday? Let's chat with Richard C. Hoagland about this when we come back on Coast to Coast AM. The man behind the world's biggest scientific experiment, which some critics claim could cause the end of the world, is a Welsh miner's son who is admitted blowing things up as a child. That's great, huh? Dr. Lynn Evans, who's been dubbed Evans the Atom, will this week switch on a giant particle accelerator designed to unlock the secrets of the Big Bang. But the 63-year-old physicist has revealed that his passion for science was fueled by the relatively small bangs that he had created with his chemistry set at his house in Welsh a long time ago. A handful of scientists, however, believe that this experiment at CERN could create a shower of unstable black holes that could literally eat the planet from within, and they are launching last-ditch efforts to halt it in the courts. One of them is Professor Otto Rossler. He's a retired German chemist. He said he feared the experiment may create a devastating quasar, a mass of energy fueled by black holes inside the Earth. Nothing, he says, will happen for at least four years. Then someone will spot a light ray coming out of the Indian Ocean during the night, and no one will be able to explain it. A few weeks later, we will see a similar beam of particles coming out of the soil on the other side of the planet. Then we will know that there is a little quasar inside the planet. Richard C. Hoagland sounds frightening. Sounds like something the science fiction writers would come up with. I was just going to say, you want to do a script on this? My God. (laughs) You know, I've been following this with with some interest because, frankly, I'm more interested in the politics around it than I am concerned about the danger. And I have a very unique perspective on the danger. All right. I'd love to hear it. If you believe, as uh, Joseph, uh, uh, um, oh, I can't remember Joseph's last name. Ah, the uh, the Oxford uh, physicist. Joseph. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll find it. I'll get it for you, but go ahead. Yeah. Anyway, I hate it when my mind does that. See, oh, it's too late. I, I said I woke you up, didn't I? Joseph Farrell. Jo- oh, the, anyway. jo- the Joseph who was on the show with you. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So he and I and people like Bavol, missing Robert tonight, um, and Graham Hancock and a few others, have been working in the vineyards for many years looking at the idea that we are not the first, that we have been preceded by a much more sophisticated epic of high technology and civilization that somehow did themselves in. If we follow that model, which is buttressed in our case by the evidence of ruins on the moon, on Mars, on some of the satellites of Jupiter, Saturn, Mm -hmm. And this very peculiar, I mean, George, you've got to see these pictures of the, of the flyby. They're absolutely bizarre. Okay. They look like the thing is not an asteroid. <laughs> and that's why the camera was cut off nine minutes before the really good pictures would have been downlinked to Earth. There is one question I've got to ask you about the blurry picture I saw, and right. I could not figure it out. But there looked like... They look like little crater tracks leading up the asteroid or yeah, whatever this yeah. is. But right at the top, there were two, I got to tell you, they have two or three squares. Yes. Perfect squares. Geometry, geometry, geometry. Now, that wasn't part of the camera picture. No, 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 no. No, this is, this is part of the object. All right, so you saw the same thing I did. Yeah. Okay. Of course. And when you see what we're going to post in the next few days, you know, uh, what, I'm, what I'm waiting for is some other data to come in from some of the other experiments on board perfect squares yep asteroid impacts or whatever hit this thing don't do that well it i mean look if, if we want to get into this and i want to get back to, to, to CERN. about the yeah. problem with cern if if we have been preceded by an amazing multi-planet solar system wide civilization when i last looked except for the planet that blew up they're all still here mm-hmm. including the earth and mars so if we've done this before, if we are repeating a, a vast historical cycle, I mean, on Earth, archaeologists and anthropologists have discovered that various civilizations kind of recapitulate cycles of civilizations that have gone before. Like we're supposed to be the iteration of, of Greece and Rome, right? Right. So if you posit this – that was an idea, by the way, that Roddenberry developed in Star Trek in some very 
interesting programs in the 60s. If you posit that the previous guys that were here before us, as I keep saying over and over again, our great-great-great-great-grandmothers, if they did this stuff we're now doing, and they didn't wind up blowing up the earth or destroying it or sucking it into an artificial black hole because of their CERNs tens and hundreds of thousands of years ago, then it's unlikely that the current tinkerers are going to have any better luck. But maybe they knew something that we don't. Maybe well, they were... that's always the, you know, one of the gray areas. I am frankly not as concerned by the technical problems as I am with the political and the and the legal. Right, but I mean, why would, for example, some real scientists, we've had Walter Wagner on the program, he'll be on again tomorrow, right. some real scientists are concerned that there could be a devastating quasar that could create and fuel black holes within this planet. I mean, they're not making this up. They, no, 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 no. They but truly think these, this could happen. These are all models. These are all calculations. And unlike what some people are led to believe in school, you know, figures can lie. You know, it's, it's what we used to call back when computers were first invented, and we're almost that old, right? Aren't we, George? Yes, we are. Geigo. I think you still use a Chinese abacus. The old abacus, yes, yeah. yes. That yeah. was right next to my slide rule. <laughs> um, <laughs> that you keep in your pocket. Re- rem- remember Geigo? Yeah. G-I-G-O? Garbage in, garbage, garbage out. out. Yep. Depending on your assumptions, and most of these calculations are so what we call model dependent that they really are not it's, it's almost like some of the climate extrapolations all it takes is the effect of a butterfly's wing on the other side of the world to change the equation so that it no longer means what the scientist who's done the calculation thinks it means so it really is completely up in the air you've got people who think it's a problem and you have people who think it's not a problem would you take that chance no and the reason is because I would go back and apply the maxim that Sagan personally told us back during the whole NASA Apollo quarantine controversy. Remember how before we went to the moon, there were some scientists who were claiming that there were little beasties on the moon, microbes. Yes. yes. And the astronauts would bring them back, infect the Earth. The Andromeda strain. And basically it would be Andromeda strain cubed. By the way, Robin and I rented a movie last night called Invasion with with uh, Nicole Kidman. It was it good? Really good. It's a nice twist. Very interesting writing, and she, of course, is great to watch yeah. in a film. So, but but in, in in that film, it was an intelligent virus that was invading the Earth, humanity, from person to person to person. So the theory back in the '60s, when before we went to the moon, was that we would go to the moon. You know, there might have been life developed on the moon. That's how little we knew back then. Didn't know about the presence of resources or water, et cetera. I mean, the moon was was virgin, untouched territory. Who knew what was on the moon? That's why we were going. So Sagan one day was part of this meeting, and he told me about it, and he told a bunch of us about it. You know, the NASA was wrestling with what does it do? And the obvious idea was, well, you quarantine the, the, the crew. You don't let them anywhere near the biosphere of Earth for however long the doctors say it might be safe, which was calculated to be something like 21 days, which is the normal gestation period for most diseases we apparently that we have run into on, on, on this planet. So Sagan was part of this group and this committee that was making this decision, and he was asked how much he would spend on such a quarantine. And what he said was so classic Carl and so apropos to the CERN problem. Because he said, basically, on the one hand, you have the worth of the Earth, which is an extraordinarily big number. You don't even have to know what the number is. How valuable is everything we all hold near and dear? Exactly. Everyone who's ever lived, every grandmother, every child, every memory, every historical event, every artwork, everything we care about is here, and that has a value. You, you, know, you can put whatever number you want on it, but it's big. It's really, really, really big. And then he said, you take the probability that we're going to find some liable microorganism on the moon that will come back to Earth and destroy everything we hold dear, which he said is a very small number. And he said, you multiply those two numbers together, and that's how much you spend on the quarantine. Okay. Well, now, that's how I approach the CERN problem. 
the the idea if i was in charge i would not do